Welcome, and uh, thank you for tuning in to this afternoon's panel as part of Word in the Street Toronto 2021 Festival, our 32nd annual and second fully virtual. I'm David Leonard, a director of Watts Board and your host. We're excited today to be presenting Hard Feelings, Processing Trauma Through Writing, a discussion of embracing the language of mental health and bringing the overlooked subsets of mental health and mental illness into focus. Our accessibility sponsor for this event is the wonderful ECW Press. Thank you to everyone there for supporting accessibility and for supporting Watts. Now, before we dive into our discussion, we'd like to recognize the land we occupy. The Toronto of today exists because of the Toronto Purchase, also known as Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in 1805, with an additional claim settlement in 2010. Watts Toronto also recognizes the history of the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Seneca Nations in this territory. The place in which Watts operates is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to care and share the land and resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Toronto, or Tikarunta, is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, with long histories on this land. And acknowledging this, it's, it's only the first step in building a practice of land stewardship and Indigenous solidarity that honors these people. And you know, these covenant and these treaties, they're not history. They're a living, breathing part of our shared responsibility in this place. We're all treaty people, all of us, everyone. And we encourage you to educate yourself about the land you occupy, no matter where you're tuning in from. For millennia, these lands have been a place to exchange ideas, share stories, and learn from each other. We're happy to have the privilege to do that with you today. So just a few announcements before we introduce today's panelists. I mentioned off the top that this is the second virtual Word in the Street Festival in 32 years. And that's not strictly true because, you know, we also have this year as part of the celebration, some special COVID safe in-person author signings at local bookstores that continue today at Queen Books in the East End and Friday at Page and Panel, which is the shop that's part of the Toronto Comic Arts Festival or TCAP as they like to call themselves. And don't forget to sign up for our upcoming panels. Today is day seven of our 10 day festival celebrating storytelling, ideas and imagination. Earlier today, we, street, we streamed fan fiction, Their World is Your Playground, with Natalie Zena Walshot, Brendan Crilly, Carrie Seaburn, and Yelly Cruz. And this evening, we'll be joined by David Jemchuk to discuss his new book, Red X, with Nabin Ruthnam. All the information about our upcoming events can be found on the Watts website, toronto.wordonthestreet.ca. You know, I should also say that Watts is supported by its sponsors, of course, which you saw on the screens before I arrived, but also by people like you. You know, when you go to our website, there's a big yellow button in the top right corner that says donate now. I just went there and made my donation. If you have the means to, please consider donating as well. Our support of Watts matters. It's what makes this festival go. And if you want to be the first to know about new videos from the Word in the Street, Toronto, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find all the panels from this year's festival, including today's. And if you like today's talk, and I hope you do, please give this video a like to help others find it as well. Now, uh, I'm pleased to announce uh, and welcome our moderator for the panel. She studied creative writing at the University of British Columbia and the University of Guelph. Her debut book of short stories, All the Shining People, is forthcoming from House of Anansi in 2022. She was a finalist for the Writers' Trust Bronwyn Wallace Award for Emerging Writers, and her writing has appeared in publications such as Grain, Geist, Prism International, Canadian Notes and Queries, and The New Quarterly. Not a bad list. She teaches creative writing at the University of Guelph, is the co-founder and artistic director of Toronto's Inkwell Workshops. Please welcome the wonderful Kathy Friedman. Oh, thank you so much, David. Um, what a pleasure to be here. I love this festival and I'm thrilled to be part of it for the first time. Uh, I'm gonna be talking to three amazing writers um, about a subject that's really close to my own heart and uh, my own life as well. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the thoughtful land acknowledgement that David made um, to recognize um, that what's taking place across Turtle Island, uh, the genocide that's taken place here, has huge impacts on mental health. Um, I was born in South Africa under apartheid and I grew up here. Um, it's my personal belief that colonialism doesn't just impact the mental health of Indigenous peoples um, in terms of intergenerational trauma, uh, things, the effects um, that we can see in terms of abuse and suicide and addictions, um, but it impacts settlers as well. Um, everything that happens um, on these lands impacts us, uh, even as we benefit from land and resources. Um, so I want to encourage you and just to encourage all of us, you know, like we've just had an election this week. Um, the National Truth and Reconciliation Day is next week. Uh, let's all move beyond surface actions, performative actions, and hold our leaders to account for the promises that they make to Indigenous communities. Uh, let's hold ourselves and each other to account so that we can take meaningful action towards uh, healing and reconciliation. 
so on that note, I want to remind folks in the audience to look after yourself during the panel. Um, if you need to step away, take a breath, get a glass of water, uh, please do so. It's the beauty of, of being online and, and virtual this year. Um, the video of the panel is going to be posted later, uh, so if you miss something, you can always uh, watch it again. And uh, of course, we really encourage and welcome questions for the panel. So if you have any, please put them in the chat um, anytime. Uh, we'll, uh, you, can, you can leave them in the chat at any time, but the last 15 minutes of our hour together will be dedicated to audience questions. Um, and just as I invited you to be compassionate with yourselves today, I encourage you to um, pose questions to our panelists um, from a place of compassion and generosity as well. Um, so far, the, the events that I've been to at Watts, um, the audience questions have been wonderful. Um, finally, if you like what you hear from the panelists today, um, don't forget that the best way to support an author is to buy their book. And uh, I'm uh, sure we'll hear uh, at uh, the end of the panel how you can do that. Um, so uh, I'm delighted to introduce our panelists. Uh, please welcome them with me. Um, Brent Laporte was born in the Ottawa Valley and through his tumultuous childhood, moved several times throughout the Valley and Northern Ontario. He lives in Southern Ontario, has been married for 30 years and has two adult children. Unatoned is his second book. And uh, Brent, if, if you have a reading prepared for us, I'm, I'm gonna invite you to, uh, to read. I do, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Uh, is my volume okay? Okay, thank you. This uh, is a reading from my book, uh, Unatoned. The book is um, it's questions that I posed for my, for my dead father who committed suicide when I was uh, nine years old. The, um, the, the, uh, or the, the section that I'm going to read is called The Darkness. I've broken this book up into several uh, very small chapters, all questions that I had for him. So I'll start. I expect, Dad, that if you were alive and you and I were able to have an honest conversation about darkness, that you would have much to say. I wish you were here to compare notes with. This is not to say that I'm eternally dark, but I cannot lie and say that there aren't times when the darkness does not envelop me. The strange thing with the darkness is that while it is cold and harsh, it's also somehow comforting, seductive. I can't really explain it and would love to be able to understand the power of melancholy, why it's both painful and satisfying. For some reason, the suffering thing brings ease to my mind, body, and soul. As I've said, I believe I'm forever cutting myself, just not with a razor. I purpose, purposely listen to dark songs that take me to places I don't want to visit. I drive by the places where I've been abused, shot at, and neglected. The funny thing is I do not resist. I grab that shadowy figure by the hand and let it lead me down its treacherous path with no thought of repercussions. Did you have the same experience, Dad? Were you triggered by a song, smell, or image? that, like a magnet, drew you and your emotions to a place that you were trying hard to avoid, but knew you belonged? Was it hard for you to accept that it was okay to be happy? That you not only ran from the light, but dove headlong into the darkness? What is it about this dark place that is so welcoming to so many? I've seen photos of you, Dad, and honestly, you look like hell. Like you were either living in hell or had just come back. Your eyes have not even the slightest glimmer of light. I'm not sure it's how it's possible, but your blue-green eyes seem dark. They're shadowy, always. There is no life in them, no optimism, no future. When did you fall into the, the pit of despair? Were you already serving a prison sentence and had no reasonable expectation of release? Was it a life without parole? More accurately, was it life without life? Did you see the writing on the wall? How bad could things have been for you that you had already seen your future and knew how it would end? Was that blanket of darkness so inviting, so tempting, that you had resigned yourself to your terrible and tragic end? Could you see no other way out? Was there no light, Dad? I've seen the darkness too. 
I've been in the darkness, Dad. And while it's inviting, I resist it when I can. Some days it's easy to resist. Some days I embrace it like it's a long lost relative. A father, maybe? Of course, whenever I do enter the void, the only people who suffer are my wife and children. Now, they don't necessarily know what's going on, but they have come to understand that while physically I'm in the same room as them, emotionally, I'm on some desolate, barren planet where I don't want, or more importantly, don't have to talk. I could just exist in a world where, if I choose, I only have to worry about me. No outside influences, no questions to be answered, no work to be done. I can sit in that darkness and just be. Strange how a person trying to find peace of mind can go from a man sitting in paradise, enjoying all of God's gifts, to a dark, cold place. And stranger that the result is the exact same, a person alone with their thoughts and no one to harm them, no one to love them, no one to affect them, and no one to judge them. It's a terribly wonderful place to visit, but an equally awful place to live. And while I do spend some time there, I've never moved in. Is this what happened to you, Dad? Did you find that place so damn peaceful that you took up residence in the, in the desolation? Is that why you were so detached from all of us? Had you already put your stuff on the shelves and moved in lock, stock and barrel? What could have happened to you that you simply said, I'm done? Did you choose, did you choose to put the black cloak around your shoulders? Oh my God. Around your shoulders from your many years rather than try to find even the smallest reason to live. I know others have experienced this darkness the way I have. And it's not as inviting as it seems. It's not your fork. It's the opposite. The evil that lurks there is inviting and comforting and seems to offer all of the answers. It does not. It only offers questions. Questions that cannot be answered. The questions are the most dangerous part of the darkness. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Brent. Um, next up, uh, we have uh, Holly Gaddery. I'm going to uh, invite her onto the screen. Uh, Holly is a writer living in Ontario. She has her MFA from the University of Guelph, and her work has been published in various literary journals, including the Malahat Review, the Fiddlehead, the Antigonish Review, Grain and Room. Fuse, her memoir of biracial identity and mental illness, was released with Guernica Editions Mirrorland Imprint in spring 2021. Hi, Holly. Hi, good to be here. Um, so I'm going to be reading from Fuse, obviously. Um, I'm just going to dump you in the middle of a the middle of a chapter here. Um, and listening to the previous reading, Rent's reading, I think it's um, a good fit. But I do just want to warn that there is self-harm and um, eat, uh, talk of eating disorders. So if anyone needs to step out. It's all about a white eyelet bikini that I bought when I was 15. It was the 90s, the golden era of supermodels, and I'd seen Cindy Crawford wear something similar. I'd loved the bikini and tried it on in my room again and again for months before I mustered the courage to wear it in public. When I finally did, it, I was at the family cottage. Lovely, a relative said. One day that will look lovely on you. I've spent my whole life waiting for that day to arrive. But, but there was a bikini before that, red with white polka dots. My mother had bought it for me, and my body hadn't reached a maturity where my father objected to my wearing it. I was only three years old, but I can still remember sitting on the end of my grandfather's wooden dock in that bikini and feeling a rising desperation. I wanted to cover my stomach which protruded over the bottoms, their uncles, cousins, and brothers. The, skin, the sun prickled my skin. The fine hairs on the back of my neck and arms began to stand up. This discomfort with my body, it couldn't have been anything I'd been taught. Not then. I was too young still. I was at an age where most kids ran naked through sprinklers, unburdened by their bodies. I told my therapist, it's just the way I am, the way I was born. What I meant was, it's no one's fault in particular. It's a little of everything. It's me, shortly after my boyfriend and I moved in together. I was seated at my dressing table wearing my favorite emerald drop earrings, an exacto knife in my lap, and vomit in my hair. I didn't need a therapist to tell me I'd become my sickness. 
I didn't have to look in the mirror to see the broken blood vessels, puffy eyes, blood running over my chest down my stomach. My boyfriend was standing at the doorway at a loss for words. I was glad. I didn't need words. I didn't want to hear, you're sick, you're crazy. Every definition was a narrowing of what was possible, of what could and couldn't be, and it tormented me. My boyfriend had gone out for the evening. It's a gathering with the guys, he'd said. No girl's going to be there. Shortly after he left, I received a call from one of his friend's girlfriends. Your guy's here with the whole gang. Where are you? I started eating. A loaf of bread, jar of olives, seven bowls of cereal. I just finished downing a glass of milk when the phone rang. I reminded myself that control starts with small acts, like not answering the phone, especially if I felt that I should. I reminded myself that solitude is a good way to kill urgency. Thank you. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, and uh, that was really, really powerful, um, really moving. Um, next up, Jacob Shire is a Governor General's award-winning poet, essayist, and journalist. His most recent full-length poetry collection, Is This Scary? ECW Press, published in spring 2021. His poems have appeared in journals, magazines, and anthologies across North America, and been nominated for a National Magazine Award. Hi, Jacob. Uh, hi. <clears throat> I'm um, sorry, should I uh, do a short reading? Um, okay, I'm going to read a couple um, poems from Is This Scary? This is um, <clears throat> Lamotrigine's song. Lamotrigine is a mood stabilizer drug. Visit the Google Images gallery of side effects and see leprosy in a hurry, bodies charcoaled, still lives, all of history in you. I brought you home from the hospital pharmacy, swaddled in plastic, rattling beside impulse buys, chewing gum for boredom, scratch card to test my luck. I heard you tap against the childproof lid. 0.08% get the rash. Pogrom skin, one in 10, receive a scarlet warning. And just <clears throat> in case must be taken from you, my pink miracle, suicide inhibitor, provider of not faith, but will to endure in absurdity without levity. The suicide in me desired to be incinerated, body up higher, metamorphosis has become the rash, entirely allegorical of nothing. Reflect feelings not found on the emotion wheel, blood libeled, skin thieved, fleshless, shame deeper than biblical. Unlike the psych, people would visit me in the burn ward. I dreamt of pity and fire. More of me wanted to want life. I tried you, Lamotrigine, a year ago, and now Pop was a Claritin at 8 a.m., impatiently watching the coffee drip and check my skin, then get on was this, was this, was this, ellipses of breaths. And the second and uh, last poem I'll read is called My Last Depression, by which I mean, yes, the previous, and yes, the definitive. I plan when, if, not to have another one, no matter what. I want to tell you in a poem so you would worry less. Is this scary? I fell from poetry. I mean, all of this that's here is so fleeting seems to require us. I couldn't bear the responsibility. Everything fell was intent then. Gravity, my one God, agency, a side effect. Leaves leapt from branches en masse. <clears throat> a star had it was the sky. My first depression offered suspense, a narrator for lit. For later in the ER plan list turned away a kid was a fake id i worked on the craft method acted till metaness metaness dropped away and now the method is the method i explain each time and am admitted i feel like i can't again is this scary or boring and what's worse i'm anxious perhaps that's why poems exist Attempts to say goodbye to all this perfectly, never finished, only abandoned. Every poem about suicide and love unfulfilled, 
I'm sorry I've failed again. Thanks. I gotta unmute myself first before I thank y'all for uh, for such uh, moving and uh, wonderful readings. Um, so welcome and thank you for being here with me. Um, I got a lot of questions, so I'm gonna uh, dive right in. Uh, my first question is uh, for everyone. Um, what do you think are aspects of mental health and addiction that are commonly overlooked in uh, the contemporary conversation? Um, and I'm curious whether uh, filling in one or more of these gaps um, was part of your motivation uh, when you were writing your book or, or when you were, uh, you know, conceiving it. Uh, were you conscious of, of areas, um, you know, that you wanted to address um, or, um, you know, perhaps your motivations were, were a little bit different. Um, so maybe I'll, uh, I'll start with Holly um, and uh, pick on you first and go from there. Why not? Um yeah, well, definitely. And one of the things I wanted to talk about was the fact that that intersectionality of being biracial and eating disorders and mental health issues was not being discussed. So I definitely wanted to shed some light on that. Now, I mean, I started writing this book over a decade ago. So even as I was writing it, things have evolved actually really quickly. And I mean, I wish some of the stuff that was out now, like on mixed race studies was done when I was younger. So, um, so I think it is moving. But one thing that I didn't address in the book at all, but I, I'd love to see changes, the first response for people with mental health issues, um, like emergency response. I've been in situations within the last year where I've been in the emergency room. I have obsessive compulsive disorder and um, just completely dismissed mm -hmm. because of that, it, about what I was feeling uh, by the, the first response staff. So. I think that needs to change. I, I would love if there was a psychologist in an ER. I would love, um, I, I'd, I'd love to, instead of being dismissed, I would just love to see the fact that, you know, if we're in emergency and we have mental health issues, that doesn't mean that we should be ignored. I'd really love to see first response changes, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for bringing um, that up. Those are um, both, you know, uh, super important issues, I think. and and. Uh, you know, there may also be some um, some intersectionality there, right, in terms of a first response and, and how, um, um, you know, race and, and mixed race identity can uh, uh, can collide there as well. Um, Brent, did you have anything to, to, to add or uh, a, a sort of a different take on the question? Well, I, I do. And it was uh, interesting. It was It's a really interesting question because I kind of looking at it from the other side of this as a, as a child of a father who committed suicide when I was nine, um, there, there really was no support for us. In fact, it was, it was, it was something that I was embarrassed about. And I write about it in the book that there was another child in my school whose father had had a heart attack and died. And I was oddly envious because of the stigma back in 1979 of, of suicide and mental health. We didn't talk about it. And frankly, even in the past 10 years, it's recently just coming forward. So while of course, folks suffering with mental illness, there needs to be additional resources. I also think that the families, uh, uh, particularly uh, the children, parents, sisters, husbands, wives of do suffer. And I know my own family suffers from, you know, the part uh, the passage I read about the darkness. Uh, they didn't really sign up for this. They didn't know that, that my wife didn't know that she was marrying this this guy who wanted to go to this desolate place from time to time just to be. So, yeah, I, I, I think that, that we need to be aware of the rippling effect of mental illness as well as the actual uh, the mental illness and, and the issues related to that. That's great. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Jacob. Right. Um, I'm used to Zoom, so I'm just having trouble finding the mute and unmute. Uh, I'm I'm unmuted now. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to ask you to repeat the question because it's like a lo pretty long question. Do you mind doing that? Yeah, of course. Um, so it's sort of a two-part question. Um, what do you think are aspects of mental health and addiction uh, that we're overlooking at the moment? And 
the second part of that question is, um, was this was filling in one or more of these gaps um, part of your motivation uh, when you were writing your book? Okay, thank you. Um, and yes, uh, something um, Holly said um, that uh, I just think was really uh, on point. My perspective about uh, psychologists in ER, and I would just add as well as psycho actual psychologists, psycho well, I'd say psychotherapists in uh, the psychiatric wards, since I, um, as I read in the book, have uh, been hospitalized um, on a couple occasions, and they're really holding cells, which do keep people safe. Um, but they're not uh, places to get well uh, in any in any respect. Uh, this you get a visit from uh, <clears throat> psychiatrist, you know, for 20 minutes a day to just review meds, you don't really have to get to talk. Uh, and there's a lot of stigma around it. So only uh, certain sort of people are, are like certain friends with a, a certain ability to have the capacity not to get totally freaked out about it. Well, visit. so it's, it's a really, you know, it doesn't doesn't help you be less depressed. Um, and I understand it's a safety aspect. I'm not taking away. Um, there's so much more I say, um, but I think instead I'll just um, mention a book uh, called um, Lost Connections by journalist Johan Hari that um, has all sorts of, uh, in addition to uh, medications, uh, I guess you could call them natural antidepressants. A lot of it centers around community and also he talks about universal basic income. Uh, but anyway, I won't, I like, but I just like really, that does such a, good book draw me into like ways to that society as a whole can like uh improve upon individual mental health um question about why i wrote the book it would seem like rather grandiose of me to suggest a poetry book given uh <laughs> you know the average poetry book sells a few hundred copies um i'm not rupee car i'm not so you know like um I, I can't really say I wrote it as a consciousness. I, I, I would write in a different um, consciousness wearing book. I'd, I'd, I'd write it in a different genre. Um, so I'd say I wrote it out of like necessity. And if it's on an individual level, maybe speaks to someone with um, similar um, mental illness struggles, then that is uh, wonderful. Uh, yeah, I feel like answer the question as best I can. Thanks. No, thank you. That, that, that's great. Um, and uh, uh, it brings me to my next question, which is actually uh, just a, a question for Brent. Um, uh, I have a, a individual questions for each of you, but we'll start there. Um, and it's around this idea of, you know, um, Jacob, what you just said about, you know, hopefully reaching someone who maybe has had similar struggles and, and being able to speak to them perhaps, uh, you know, through the stigma, which you, you mentioned as well, or in spite of the stigma. Um, and Brent, I'm, I'm curious about your book, which is structured, um, as you um, mentioned um, during your reading, as a series of questions uh, for your late father. And uh, so it's very intimate, very personal. And yet you wrote in the book that your hope was to offer comfort to others. And so I'm curious, um, you know, to what extent did you have um, an ideal reader in mind? Were you conscious of an ideal reader as you were writing it, um, imagining the sort of person that you hope to reach? Um, or was your process really just, you know, um, communing with your with your dad in a way? Yeah, I, I it ne yeah, it never, ever. Um... I never set it out to actually be what it became. It was mm -hmm. more, uh, I had this creepy feeling one night that my dad father was going to be sitting at my writing table as I was walking up to my loft. And mm -hmm. I, he wasn't, obviously. Uh, but I had mentioned that to Michael uh, Holmes, my, my editor. And he said, boy, that, that would be interesting because I'm sure you'd have some questions for him. Mm -hmm. So that started this journey. Uh, and as I wrote, I realized that Again, I'm not qualified to give anybody any advice. I mean, I we keep it together, but we barely keep it together some days. But if somebody reading this is either going through uh, an abusive relationship, either with a parent or a spouse, uh, or has gone through it, whether it's physical, mental, or sexual abuse, uh, I'm hoping and I, that they realize there you can come out the other side of this thing. You're not married to a conclusion, you know. Um, 
th there are options for you that that you can survive a an abusive childhood traumatic as it was and do your best to lead a successful happy normal life whatever the heck that might be to any one of us so that would be the folks that i'd be reaching out to if if there was an intention it would be let people know that it's okay you're not alone there there's a bunch of us out there probably more than you know and we're all here for you thank you um jacob moving to you um uh, you mentioned your your experience um, being in, in, uh, in uh, having experience in a psychiatric ward, and many of the poems are set uh, in and around um, the psych ward. I was wondering the reason for using this particular scaffolding. Um, I don't know. Was it, um, it uh, autobiographical? And as you said, you felt just sort of a necessity to to write about that experience. If you can take us into that a little bit more, um, or was there something that this setting helped you convey about living with mental illness uh, that you were drawn to? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the book's quite autobiographical, and in the tradition of. Uh, you know, quote unquote, uh, confessional poetry. And those are, um, at least in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, at least in North American context, uh, the like first poets to write about the, you know, when it was way more stigmatized to write about um, uh, psychiatric words were like Sylvia Plath, uh, Robert Lowell, and like John Berryman, some, some others from that um, <clears throat> kind of school of, of poetry. So they, the, those poets have been really influential on me. And, you know, so, and yet still, I thought on one hand necessity and I, you know, uh, wrote, uh, I wrote uh, what I, the first poem in the book. Yeah. I wrote that actually in notes while I was in the psych, psych ward. So the book kind of began uh, in journey of a very severe depression uh, we're actually, um, I went there to stop myself from self-harming. I sort of checked myself in, which is actually harder to do than some, some people think you have to be rather compelling as I sort of expressed in the last, the second poem I read. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's to, and I think like, I think more people will probably be in a psychiatric ward than you might think. That's something I find that once you're once you're in one, you talk to other people, like they're like, yeah, yeah, actually, there was like this time in my life as there too. But it, um, they're really just also as a writer, they're really fascinating spaces. They're really strange. They're really surreal, and they're really messed up. And so it also, you know, there's sort of the sort of a double consciousness, I guess you call it, of, of being severely depressed and needing to be there. It's not really a better place, unfortunately, to be in that state. While also kind of, you know, examining it as a writer's lens and being like, this is like really the, there's all sorts of things that I won't like, wrote, that I wrote poems about, like, I don't know. How, like how weird it is to take a shower when there's no when the water just goes everywhere so you don't like hurt yourself in the, the shower anyway like for example it's there's like lots of strange there's a, it's a very strange place a surreal place so so like those at least for some of the reasons i decided to situate um uh, at least um some of the poems in the book there that's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I love what you said about the kind of double consciousness of needing to be somewhere, but also the writer part of your brain that's that's processing these little details and the, the, the surreality of, of the situation. Um, Holly, I'm, I'm curious to ask you um, about writing about your family. Um, it's something that I just did for the first time. I, I just published a, a nonfiction, creative nonfiction piece about my dad, and it was uh, it was terrifying. And um, I'm curious, um, you know, while I was reading Fuse, I was just struck by how much care that you took writing about your parents' struggles, being really honest, um, but also writing about them with a great deal of love and, and, and compassion. Uh, I'm curious how you went about striking that balance. And I'm also curious what your process was like. Um, for example, you know, did you ask their permission? Did you talk to them about what you were doing? Um, uh, did you have them vet any parts of the book before it was published? Um, I, I, I'd love to hear uh, how you went about that because it's it's certainly something that I struggle with. So, 
Yeah, uh, I think most people would ask permission or vet, but I did neither. Um, I spent a lot of my life being told not to talk and to be quiet. Uh, so I wasn't giving anyone any right to tell me to write or not write anything. I was just going to trust myself to come from a place where I wasn't trying to assign blame, but I was trying to reach an understanding. And when you're trying to truly reach an understanding, when you're not going in with this blame seeking um, agenda, if you truly want to understand what's happened to you and why you are the way you are, you're going to naturally try to understand the people around you. And that does not involve blaming them, especially when there's someone like your family who not everyone has family members that they love, but in my case I did. So I honestly was trying to understand where certain members of my family were coming from um, when, when they said things or treated me in certain ways. So I, I do love what Anne Lamott said, which, you know, says that, you know, you own your stories are you, yeah, you own them. You don't owe anybody anything. If people wanted you to write with, write warmly about them, they should have treated you better. I, I do love that, but I also think that, um, it's, again, especially when it comes to people you love and families, that you, you should deal with things compassionately. So for me, uh, when I first started writing the book in my twenties, I was pretty angry. Um, and, uh, so I, between the beginning and the end, I actually had four children of my own, um, which really helped me reposition myself as someone writing about her parents. And, you know, seeing the way that I'm interacting with my children with my mental illnesses and how, you know, a running joke in our family, whenever I do something weird is my one of my kids saying, I'm saving this for my therapist. I'm like, yeah, write it down. You know, it's, and I, it's just seeing on that end how it, how it how I must seem to them and not thinking I would never want them to hold back but also I would never want I'd like them to approach uh, a scene about me with compassion so that's what I what's what I really tried to do with my parents and how am I going to feel like about writing this in 30 years 40 years 50, how am I going to feel about this when my parents are gone am I going to be okay with the fact that I wrote this about them so a lot of stuff got cut um, but it's not stuff that would affect the overall narrative. So I, I had to write what I could live with, essentially. And my parents uh, haven't read the book. Nobody in my family has. So nobody is upset. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much for, for taking us into, uh, into your process with that. Um, so I have my, my next questions for everyone on the panel as well. And uh, there's a quote that uh, Therese Marie Myatt said in an interview about writing her memoir, Heart Berries. Um, it's a memoir that also deals with uh, mental illness and childhood abuse. Um, and she said in the interview, um, that's the thing about naming your culprits and speaking your story. You transcend that experience once it's in the light. Once I named my transgressions and transgressors, I was able to put down my pain. And um, I'm curious how you each respond to that quote. Um, did you find that that was true for you? Um, did writing and now sharing uh, about trauma change your relationship with your past in any way? Um, maybe, uh, maybe we can start with uh, Jacob. I was hoping you would not start with me, but... Um, <laughs> It's, it's hard to say. I mean, also is, you know, this book, like I wrote, uh, I wrote most of it in like a year during, um, well, I guess about eight months of uh, really severe depression. Um, and then um, I went back to it years later, because uh, I actually did an MFA in non creative nonfiction. Um, but anyway, I don't know why I'm telling that story. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I had a lot of distance from the poems and I haven't, you know, um, at that time. And then they finally <laughs> were published like, and then the pandemic hit. And I mean, I'm not sure I'm alone in this. It has been incredibly challenging for my like mental health and illness and like doing these readings on Zoom and, pa and uh, I guess it's on a couple panels and you know it's not i don't really have a, a, a 
recovery story I, I've managed, but it's just been like, uh, I've just been getting through and there's a little bit of like, kind of, kind of irony for me and like reading these poems, it's like, it's not a, um, and I suppose I don't, I don't, I'm not saying the quote suggests this, but um, I, I guess I'm uh, su suspicious of what you might call the overcoming story. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, and also I have a, a chronic uh, physical illness. I have uh, autoimmune dis disorder as well. And so like that in a very more understandable way for most people is there's no cure, but there's there's ups and ups and downs. So I don't know if you ever get to the other side of like the river as it were and able to look back this uh, complete and total insight. Um, so, you know, it's an art, for me, it's, it's an art object and I'm proud of it. Uh, but as far as it, I, I think it's had a lot more healing from uh, psychotherapy and uh, medication to be like really frank about it. And that's why I didn't want you to start with me. <laughs> um, maybe there'll be more um, uh, uplifting answers from the other um, uh, panelists, but, but thanks. I think to me, that's uplifting though, right? To sort of shine a light on and say, you know, the overcoming story is not where it's at. And actually, you know, it's a like, I'm managing day to day still. To me, that, that provides, um, you know, so, so a measure of comfort uh, for me to hear, anyways, and um, and also, um, yeah, I think it's I think it's a, a an answer that um, perhaps deromanticizes a little bit um, some of uh, what we might think of mm. what, what it's like to to, to write and, and publish a book. So I, I actually think it's a great answer, and and you're welcome to you know the quote is there to to either you know identify with or, or disagree with, and and so I yeah I uh, I. I um, I absolutely appreciate your answer, and I'm, I'm glad I put you on the spot. <laughs> Made you go first, um, Holly or, or or Brent. Um, why don't we go to to you, Brent? Sure. Um, it's a really important question. Uh, I when you when you sent it, or, or you know, if you, you stated it, I was like, that's really interesting. And then Jacob, I have to say, I never looked at it from your perspective, and I appreciate what you said because it's. I looked at, I didn't look at it from the end game. I looked at it more from my own perspective, my own personal choice is to not name, uh, because I, I don't agree with it. I don't agree with it and I don't disagree with it. Quite frankly, I'm kind of Switzerland here in that I'm, it's personal. It's everybody who's experienced any type of abuse, sexual or physical has the right. And that by the way, the power. To, 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 in my mind, I was looking at this as do, would I want to name these people or not? And um, in, in my world, it's my choice where I, I find society at a time says, hey, you, you should speak out. You know, uh, you, sh you should say something. And um, I think if you choose to, that's your right. Uh, you have also the right to say, you know what, this is my experience. And I, I don't want the pressure of, of having to state what happened it's it's very personal for me so i don't agree with it i don't disagree with it but i i really do appreciate jacob's um perspective and holly certainly looking forward to to yours thank you great thanks so much brent and uh holly i'm uh i'm curious about uh about your reaction to the quote yeah i immediately thought of an interview that i read um on CBC with Vicki Laveau Harvey, who wrote The Erratics, which is a memoir that takes place in Alberta. And it's about coming to deal with her narcissistic mother after a narcissistic mother shatters her hip and they find out that she's been starving her dad, um, starving her husband, the mother has. And the interviewer asked her, did you find writing this cathartic? And she said, uh, no, you, you do the healing before you sit down to write. Mm -hmm. And that is something that resonated with me and I am in no shape. I don't consider myself um, transient. I do not think that I have transcended anything, but a lot of, for me, a lot of the hard work was done before, like before I even sat down to create something that arguably is, may or may not be a piece of literature. Um, so I, I, like Brent, I don't disagree with it. I think that if you feel like it helps you, you know, shed light on it and shed light on yourself and you feel better for it, then that's great. Um, I didn't write Fuse to feel better about anything. Oh, I, I mean, I was an addict. Um, I still am an addict. 
uh, you know, OCD, self-harm, bulimia, like all over the place. And it sounds like, you know, I, I lost some horrible lottery to have all those things, but they're actually co-occurring diseases. It's not that uncommon to have all these things at once. But I did all like the healing, like all the heavy duty healing. I got sober, all that stuff um, before I sat down to write. So when I heard about, you know, writing it and feeling this lightness, I thought, I don't know about that. I felt maybe a little bit heavier after actually. I felt very uncertain of how this was going to be received, but also just thinking that I would have killed to read anything like this when I was struggling to feel less alone. And I, I loved what Brent said about, um, about not, if somebody wants to write about this, great. If somebody doesn't want to write about it or share anything about it, great. Like do, do what works for you. And I, I loved what Jake said about, uh, you know, opposing the healing or recovery narrative. I mean, I really do because if people think that, you know, I'm better now, I, I'm not, I'm, I mean, I'm better, but I'm not cured. I'll never be cured. I'm still, I'm still, I still struggle sometimes a lot. So I, I, I don't disagree with it. I think maybe some people will feel this unbearable lightness from writing it, but that is not the case. I appreciate your answers because they, they seem realistic to me, you know, um, and I, I, I appreciate that, you know, but just a realistic and honest about what the process has been like um, for each of you. Um, so I'm going to I've got um, I've still got a whole bunch of questions. There's there's a bunch of things I'm really curious to ask you all. But um, um, I think we've got one question here uh, from the audience that uh, maybe we'll get to. And if there's time, I might go back to one of my questions um, and really just um, invite everyone uh, listening to today, watching today, please, you know, put your questions in the chat. Um, so the question that I have here is, uh, do you believe in the power of forgiveness? Do you believe in the power of forgiveness? And uh, yeah, I'm not sure if anyone, uh, Holly, did you, did you yeah. wanna go first? Yeah, um, I think it depends what there is to forgive. Um, you know, in, in my case, yes, I do. But I, there, you know, there's a lot of people that go through things that are unforgivable. And I mean, the, the only un, really truly unforgivable things that happen in my life I did to myself. So whether or not I forgive myself is up for debate, but um, I believe in forgiving the people around me, definitely. Thank you. And uh, Brent? Sure, uh, I'll jump in. It's that the, the, the title of my book is Unatoned. Mm -hmm. It comes from a, a Bruce Springsteen song called My Father's House, where uh, the last line of the song is where our sins lie unatoned. And uh, I, I clearly do believe in forgiveness. I believe in accountability, though. Um, you know, you have to reconcile this. And, I, and it took me this book and many, many years to actually, while my father couldn't answer any of the questions that I had for him with respect to the alcoholism, the abuse, and even obviously the suicide, uh, his sins may lie unatoned, obviously, but I think it's up to the, again, to the person to go, can I let this go or am I gonna carry this, this big weight around my shoulder with me uh, for the rest of my life? So I think that you, so I do believe in it. And I think it's something that it's a choice to, to simply move on. And then as Halei said, there are certain things that are unforgivable, but it's more of a reconciliation at that point and say, hey, what am I going to do here? Like, I don't want to wake up every day and face this. So, yeah, fair enough. Uh, thanks. For, thanks for that. Um, um, Jacob, did you did you want to answer? Should we go to the next question? Yeah, I feel the the subject of my book isn't really relevant to that question. So I have all sorts of thoughts on it, but I think I'll just leave it with the authors who you know really are engaging that. Uh, you know, tension in their, in their works. So I'll just, sure. that's all I'll say, yeah. And uh, this is a question just for, for Halle. Um, you mentioned your family has not read your book. Uh, do you know why? I assume because it would make them deeply uncomfortable. Um, reading about themselves is would be difficult. I was really careful to only tell my story. So if I was, you know, guessing at too much of what my parents' motivations were or if I was thinking, hmm, maybe my parents are this way because of this, this, and this. I mean, I really didn't get into my family members' stories too much, only how their stories intersected with mine. So I did try to keep it really 
me centric, but I mean, my mom just, you know, my printer broke down because my three year old shoved pennies into it. So I had to get her to print out a section for me once. And like she, just printing out that section, glancing at it made her deeply uncomfortable. And she, I mean, reading about yourself is uncomfortable. I, I get that, but I don't think that they're ready to deal with it or face it or even acknowledge it. I mean, that's part of, that's part of the problem with mental health is that, and with my mental health specifically, is that you just didn't talk about it. You know, anything. I, I could be as bulimic and drunk as I wanted to, as long as I did it quietly. And I think, I don't think my parents didn't love me. I just think they had no clue how to deal with it. So I think reading it would just be too much for them. And do, do I think that maybe they should suck it up and do it? To tell you the truth, I'm, I'm torn on that. That one is half of me is happy that they haven't and that I don't have to deal with those reactions. I mean, enough, enough um, extended family and friends have that I think they're being good things are being brought to my parents' attention anyway. So I'm, I'm torn on whether how I feel about them not reading it, but for the most part, it, it doesn't bother me too much. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, uh, I want to ask um, one of one of my questions, uh, and we're we're running out of time, so uh, getting to the end. That um, uh, so, uh, just a, a short question to end from here. What brings you joy in your writing life, and um, was there a specific instance of joy, uh, whether it was writing this book, publishing it, you know, seeing your seeing it in print for the first time, um, uh, you know, sh sharing it with folks, doing readings and, and panels like this. Um, uh, yeah, what uh, what what part of the writing life uh, brings joy for you? Did you want me to start with this one then? Yeah, please go for sure. it, Brent. I'll just jump in. Uh, it's uh, so unfortunately, both books that I've I've had published are, are really quite dark. So there's mm. not, nothing really joyful in either one of them. Uh, so, but I but I also understand this is a panel of of writing and and encouraging others to write. And, and uh, so I, I do have, uh, obviously, I, I've, got a, I've got a pretty good sense of humor. I, I've written some, uh, I call it my million dollar notebook, uh, <laughs> where I've got all these ideas and these scripts and partial scripts. And it's a lot of, it's, it's the lighter side. It's, it's uh, trying to write comedy uh, is the joy, joyful part for me. These last two have not been a whole bucket of fun for anybody. Uh, so so I'm trying to find a little joy. I love writing. I enjoy it's, it's, it's a passion. I can't stop myself, whether it's a good topic or a bad topic. And I think all of us share that. Otherwise we just wouldn't do it. Um, because we know that it's not the most financially, um, uh, successful thing in Canada. And we get that we do this because we love it. So, uh, the joy is just getting it out there. So thanks. Mm. Thanks Brent. Holly or, or Jacob, did you have a Holly? Uh, yeah, I was gonna say I just like the process of writing that like that moment that you get that kind of fizzy bubbly feeling when you know that you're on to something and then you have that like shakabuku moment, that swift spiritual kick to the head that alters your perception of reality and you just grab it because I, I never know if anything's gonna actually like see anybody else's eyes besides mm -hmm. mine. I mean that's great when it does. Um, and I, I love, especially with Fuse, when you know, I've had people from around the world contact me, people who aren't necessarily even biracial, but biracial and mixed race people too, saying like, I got this, you saw me, I connected with this, oh my God, that's amazing. But you don't, I'm not, you're not always guaranteed that. So thankfully I don't do it for that. It's that, again, that kind of effervescent bubbly feeling when you're on to something. And then inevitably it's followed by, you know, as Anne Shirley would say, the depths of despair when you're like, why did I start this? But it's worth it for that for that feeling, I'd say. And Jacob, mm. you you mentioned sort of the pride um, in, in 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 producing a piece of art. Mm. Yeah, I did, didn't I? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about joy. <laughs> I know I'd rather at least not want to talk about joy or pride. Um, yeah, I don't. Know. Um, <clears throat> It's how I was, I know it's quite, I would say the same thing, but related in that when it's going well, there's this, for me, complete immersion 
in it and it feels it feels very organic and it doesn't feel uh like later in revision editing that's where it's more like mechanical um and like more the i don't know intellectualized but um for me this kind of when when the i guess the flow happens um it's it's strange way you know i'm writing about like this this is quite a also a dark book um but when i'm inside that um you know organic process uh, i'm kind of taken out of like the everyday minutia that uh is so stifling and so also i write um first thing in the morning when i guess i still have like a, a toe left and like uh dreamland or whatever because like things have been entirely coming to focus and all the worries uh, of the day so i feel like when i can enter that which i don't which doesn't always often doesn't happen but sometimes does um i don't know if i call that joy but i guess it's um it's it's a certain amount of being at, uh, organically attentive which is perhaps joy um, that's my that's my best answer. Um. That's a great answer. No, thank you. Um, and thank you. Thanks to all of you so much. And I'm sorry, there was uh, one other question that we didn't get to, unfortunately. Um, but I just uh, really want to thank all of our panelists um, for uh, being here today, for being um, yeah, just just honest and real, and um, you know, giving us some insight into the process of, of writing these books. I have the three books here um, with me. I'll just hold them up because, oh my goodness, these are these were all just um, astonishing to read. So, uh, thank you, thanks to all of you, and and thanks to so much to everyone for for listening today as well. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thank you all for your conversation, for your vulnerability, for your wisdom that you've, you know, accrued over time. Um, it's been a very insightful hour. And uh, you can see in the comments on the, on the chat that everyone is also sending you lots of love and lots of gratitude um, for, uh, for sharing some time with us. So thank you all so much. And thank you to Kathy for facilitating this discussion. It's truly a pleasure. Thank you to everybody who's been tuning in from home. You can find as Kathy held them up, you can find Unatoned by Brent Laporte, Fuse by Holly Gattery, and Is This Scary by Jacob Shear at our virtual bookstore in partnership with Another Story Bookshop and our official ebook and audio bookseller, Rakuten Kobo. You have four more days to sign up for our giveaway in partnership with Rakuten Kobo. You can visit toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca slash 2021-festival-contest for your chance to win a bunch of special prizes, including a new Kobo e-reader. Remember, for each day of the festival that you tune into, you will receive a bonus entry code. Today's bonus entry code is MINDFUL. Be sure to tune in this evening for a conversation with David Demchuk to discuss his newest book, Red X, with Nabin Ruthnam. You can find today's panels and all previous Watts 2021 panels on our YouTube channel, The Word on the Street Toronto. For more information about this year's lineup, as well as the panelists that you've heard today, visit our website at toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. Thanks again for joining us. Take care of yourselves and have a great evening.